Good morning. morning. I suppose you will um, place me as a co-host and then I can... Uh... Yes, yes, yes. Let me make you a co-host. Good morning to you. How are you doing? Ah, good. Okay. Early hours, but we'll survive. Wonderful. Okay, you know I co-host. I am called. I am called Norman. I am from the Afghan Union, uh, supporting with the virtual Afghan Internet Government Forum. I'm going to be supposed to be joined by uh, Anastina as a co-host, but it's fine. Uh, you can let me know uh, in case of one of your panelists or uh, presenter joins, then I can always uh, give them the right so that sure. they can able to be present. Yeah, but you can also sure. do the same. Yeah, so uh, I don't know if I'll be able to as a co host to assign co host. Maybe yes, not. you will. I should be okay. But you in this case, I'll, I'll just ask you uh, if there is a need. So, yeah, Stasia yeah. is the only one who who should be um, certainly co -host because she will share the screen. The others okay. I think will share the screen, so it shouldn't be a problem. And I guess uh, the microphone settings are, are open, so anyone can grab a mic. I, I, I guess so. That should be okay. Okay, perfect. Thanks.
morning, Andreana. So, colleagues, you can also let me see if I can actually uh, move her to co host. You can just move Andreana as a co host. All right, all right. And Anastasia has joined, so you can also move her to co host. Thank you. Morning, Anastasia. That's done. Thank you. Hello to everyone. Morning. Yeah. It will be slow with the start. We'll wait for people. Plus, I guess Jonas and Barak will be a little bit late, so we're not in a in a rush.
Good morning, Mahmoud. Welcome. We'll start uh, in some minutes waiting for people to get here. Hello, good morning. Yeah, we were supposed to begin like about now, but maybe we can give it a few more minutes if for some people to join and begin here. Yeah. Exactly, we'll give some five more minutes or something. So no worries. Thanks. And the question for the colleagues from the organization. Um, the session is recorded and it will be placed somewhere on the uh, African IGF website or, or not. Not sure if you heard me. Very welcome. I'll start in a few minutes. Thank you. Morning, Jonas. Hey, good morning, Vlada. Good to see you. We didn't start yet. We'll wait for a few more minutes if anyone joins. Sure, yeah, that's a good idea. Barak will also be in. Hi, Anastasia. Jump in and be active. Uh, good morning. Uh, quite some early hours. Well, at yeah. least where we are. Uh, this is uh, not that usual, I guess, for Africa to start that early. But uh, we are going to. to um, break a little bit uh, the um, tremor. So welcome to the panel, uh, Security of Digital Products and Services, uh, a development perspective. This is organized by the Geneva Dialogue on Responsible Behavior in Cyberspace. Um, my name is Vladimir Ravinovich. I'll be the moderator, the host of the session today. Um, the, the name Geneva Dialogue might uh, be a little bit uh, misleading, maybe in the African part, because it might signal something which is Geneva-based. Actually, it's just a uh, uh, driven or, or motivated uh, in a way from uh, from Geneva with the support of the Swiss government and Diplo Foundation, but it is a global project. We'll get back to that in uh, in a second. <clears throat> I wanted to uh, uh, pinpoint what is the um, the relevance of the question, basically. Um, so if we look at cyber attacks and generally cybersecurity, which is obviously a focus of the session today, uh, majority of uh, attacks uh, actually exploit some vulnerabilities in cyberspace. In, in many cases, it is actually about the uh, digital products, digital services, which are not perfect, which uh, do have vulnerabilities. Uh, so there are many ways how we can address uh, cybersecurity or becoming more resilient. One of them is to raise the costs for these attacks, certainly by uh, uh, more of the uh, 
combat against cyber crimes and all rules and norms of uh, behavior in cyberspace, but also more secure uh, products. So that's the focus of our discussion today. Uh, we have uh, heard about uh, reducing vulnerabilities in, in man, many places, different places, including at the, let's say, high level um, discussions by the diplomats in the United Nations and elsewhere. Uh, but the question is, what can actually uh, the vendors or the product developers uh, do to make uh, their products more secure? But also, what is the role of the governments? What is the role of the regulators? What is the role of uh, us as, as users, in a way, uh, in, this, uh, in this discussion? How can we enhance security of digital products? Uh, Geneva Dialogue is uh, an initiative led by Diplo Foundation in the Swiss Federal Department of Foreign Affairs. But it gathers, uh, as I mentioned, lead companies around the world uh, to share best practices or good practices, uh, how they actually implement what we can call security by design, or what do they do to make their products more secure. Uh, the partners uh, include Bison, part of Sberg Group, um, Cisco, uh, Ensign Info Security, FireEye, Huawei, Kaspersky, Microsoft. Uh, we have colleagues from the Papua New Guinea ICT cluster. Uh, SIGPA, Siemens, uh, Swiss Re, uh, Tata Consultancy Services, UBS Bank, WiseKey, and Wu Security. We don't have, at the moment, any of the African partners on board. So this might be uh, already an invitation for all of you to uh, think about uh, helping us uh, bring in more of the private sector that comes from Africa, not necessarily only IT companies and telecoms, but also others that basically produce, in a way, uh, various uh, digital products. It could be software, hardware, devices, uh, uh, cloud uh, integrated solutions, uh, and so on. So think about it while we go on. Uh, we have a number of observers and other um, institutions, organizations that are in a way uh, helping us uh, to, to shape this discussion further. So the, the invitation is not just extended to the companies, but also other organizations that want to uh, help in this dialogue. Um, and. Uh, we tend to align the Geneva Dialogue discussions with other um, mainly multi-stakeholder, but not only uh, initiatives and processes such as the Paris Call on the uh, Stability of Cyberspace, uh, Charter of Trust, uh, Cybersecurity Tech Accord, uh, also the work of the group of governmental experts in the open-ended working group in the United Nations. I don't know to what extent you have been following these discussions. Um, so it would be interesting to learn whether there are any related discussions uh, across the African continent. Um, we're aware, of course, the, of the um, Malaba Convention, uh, which is a sort of a groundwork when it comes to security, but it will be interesting to see whether there are any anchors, particularly to this or other instruments across Africa and, and definitely experiences. Uh, and recently we have published a, a document uh, for comments, which uh, outlines some of the key terminology, such as what does it mean security by design, security by default, um, vulnerability management uh, and uh, disclosure and so on, and the number of best practices actually by uh, composed by the companies that I mentioned. Uh, so I encourage you to take a look at the document. We still are open for receiving uh, comments and reflections on the document and uh, uh, feel free to, to uh, reflect its uh, document. It's also available on the website that my colleague shared uh, in the chat. What is the outline of the session? Uh, well, it's basically, even though the, the full slot of the session is one and a half hours, we thought of rather something shorter, maybe an hour, even less, to uh, discuss with you uh, what might be perspectives related to security of digital products uh, in Africa, particularly what are the impacts for development. Uh, we would look a little bit more into what are those good practices and challenges that uh, partners of Geneva Dialogue outlined uh, but also what, uh, what comes from, from your experience across Africa. And then close the discussion with um, looking at some of the governance uh, approaches and models. So what can actually be the, the good way to partner the companies with the regulators, governments, and uh, certainly uh, organizations and, and users, the user communities to, um, to enhance the security of digital products. I do have um, uh, two guests. The third one will join later, but uh, they're not really the panelists. Uh, so in a way, we envisage this more as a discussion um, with, uh, with us. I'll start with, uh, well, with my left, uh, with uh, Ms. Anastasia Kazakova, who is the Public Affairs Manager of Kaspersky. She's uh, also one of the very active uh, partners in uh, Geneva Dialogue. Uh, 
Uh, then uh, we have uh, uh, Mr. Jonas Gratz, who is a political uh, affairs officer uh, at the Federal Department of Foreign Affairs uh, of Switzerland. Um, basically, someone who is, uh, in a way, hosting the Geneva Dialogue. And we expect uh, later on to uh, have also Barak uh, Otieno, who is a trustee of the Kenyan uh, ICT uh, Action Network. Uh, with me, I also have a, a chat moderator, uh, my colleague Andrana Gavrilovic from Diplo Foundation. Uh, as a modus operandi of a discussion, uh, we, since it's a small small group, we encourage you certainly yes to use the chat, but even better uh, to maybe switch on the mics and cameras if you feel like, uh, and and make it more more interactive and more uh, um, of an of an exchange in a way. Uh, since it's a it's a small group, I would uh, uh, invite uh, each one of you to briefly introduce yourselves uh, if that's okay. And I I'll start with the well on my screen. Uh, with Beryl first, and then maybe Mahamat and Megan and uh, uh, Olawumi. Uh, Beryl, if you if you wish to briefly introduce yourself. Okay. Hi everyone. Hey, myself, my name is Mohammed Rehisen. I'm from Chad. And uh... Mohammed, go on. You are muted. Uh, okay. I said my. My name is Mohammed Ray Hussein. I'm from Chad. I'm 27 years old and I'm a field operator. I'm working at the refinery here in, in Yemena. So, if you have any question to ask me, so you are welcome. Perfect. Excellent. Uh, and uh, well, I, I've noticed that uh, Chad is. Uh, recently particularly been uh, or became uh, quite active uh, with the uh, inter-governance aspects and so on and many of the interesting communities. Well, you hosted the African IGF last year. Uh, so I'm sure you will have quite much to contribute. Uh, feel free to post it in chat at any point or switch on the mic. Uh, going back to, to Beryl, uh, Beryl. Hello everyone. Um, my name is Beryl. I'm from uh, Kenya. I'm based in Nairobi. I'm affiliated with uh, the Kenya ICT Action Network. Um, but I'm also an activist. I've uh, been doing uh, human rights work for nearly 10 years. And uh, currently, I'm working as a communication consultant doing um, campaign and communications. Thank you. Uh, that would be an, uh, an interesting perspective also when it comes to uh, civil society and activist uh, uh, Angle, um, thanks for joining. Uh, I don't know whether the colleagues from the from the um, IGF Secretariat want to uh, introduce uh, as well. Yeah, go ahead. Yes, yes, sure. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm called Norman. I'm your host today. I'm volunteering with IGF to host this session. Uh, I also am a member of Africa, uh, Internet Society Better Chapter, and I've also been a youth at IGF fellow in 2018. Uh, currently, I work with Digital Grassroots as a community leaders. Uh, our coordinator, and I also volunteer with uh, a civil rights, civil, civil society organization in Uganda called Digital Literacy Initiative that is actually empowering young people and women in the digital space. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for the support uh, for the event. Uh, we'll definitely uh, need it. Uh, okay, still stay tuned. Uh, I wonder whether Megan, uh, whether you wish to um, introduce yourself. Certainly, if you if you can switch on the mic uh, for some people, it might be also too early or uh, the connection is not uh, excellent. But if you can, you can jump in. Um, and then uh, Olawumi, do you want to um, introduce yourself? Or else you can certainly again share in the chat your affiliation and your your interests. Okay, let's move on. Uh, we'll start with, uh, with a, a brief discussion on um, um, the impact Hello. of... Hello? Yeah, go ahead. We can hear you. Okay, we'll start with the first part of discussion, which is, which is uh, related to the impacts of uh, <clears throat> vulnerabilities on 
well, development uh, and uh, economies in general, development perspective as well, and uh, look a little bit into roles and responsibilities of, uh, of uh, stakeholders. Uh, so I'll uh, ask uh, Anastasia to map this field with uh, the main um, risks based uh, or related to security, safety, uh, maybe even some non-tangible risks, and one particular interesting aspect, which is uh, supply chain security. Even though it might look a little bit more technical, um, it is very, very important uh, just to see what are the trends when it comes to risks and, uh, and diff different types of attacks. And as I say, you should be able to share the screen um, or the, the presentation if you wish. Uh, so you can, you can give it a try. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hello to everyone. Good morning to everyone. Um, it's then, oh, it's more than two a.m. Then I am in Moscow. We have very snow. I hope you also have a good um, mood already. Uh, so I will share my screen. Please let me know if this works. All good? Yes, perfect. Great. So um, before talking about the impacts uh, of exploiting vulnerabilities and possible implications for the economic or digital um, development, I just want to give a brief overview what the actual supply chain attack is. This is um, the main attack when actually the kill chain represents the compromising or exploiting vulnerabilities in technologies. So, um, but before I wanted to uh, illustrate several layers and therefore several possible uh, opportunities for threat actors to compromise your network and compromise you. Um, and this is just the, the traditional illustration and please uh, mind that the software that would be disclosed in the slide doesn't really represent the particular strengths or weakness of the digital software. It's just for illustration. So usually it starts with the uh, with the centra with the corporate network, and the first layer is usually the the highest has the highest uh, security. Uh, this is a traditional IT infrastructure, uh, well understood, uh, well tested, and well secured. That's a part of corporate infrastructure. The far away from this green zone, uh, the less um, secured and more vulnerable we are. Uh, so the next layer is the yellow zone, which represents so-called bring your own device culture, uh, when employees of the company um, bring um, different laptops, uh, smartphones, and they also enrolled in the company infrastructure. Some extent of the control is possible there, but still it's less secure than the, the first zone. Next one is the red zone, which actually represents the services, external services, which the company may use, email services, storage, servers, um, and it's usually outside of the company infrastructure. So if the third party service is compromised somewhere on the red zone, then there are obvious business impacts on the company's IT infrastructure, but still it will be relatively safe. And the final zone, the blue zone, which represents services um, based on the resources that do not belong to the company. And the impacts would be the hardest, would be the toughest ones. So if the attack happens at this particular layer, at the hardware infrastructure or the software infrastructure, um, the impact would be the most, I would say, the gravest for, for the company. Looking at the, your particular uh, layers that you uh, use um, and each of us use uh, uses every day, so they also pass uh, several layers. The first one starts with the hardware, and the, they are just illustration of how many software we use every day. Uh, then we use uh, the hardware and the software layer, uh, a multiple of applications um, for accessing the internet, for using different uh, opening different documents and so on. And again, the, the uh, hardware that we also use. The main point of this illustration is just actually the uh, deliver the message that none of the, the software currently is a standalone software. This is the software that has multiple components produced around the globe. So for example, I might have the keyboard that is designed somewhere in the US, 
uh, but has been manufactured somewhere in the Asia Pacific, uh, delivered through, uh, through Europe, and that a lot of the supply chains or the value chains embed in the modern software. Therefore, um, this actually says about the high vulnerability of the today's um, IT infrastructure. And um, the, the point is that, um, so the question comes, how then therefore to trust the current software? And the paradox is that we cannot trust anyone, but we must trust everyone. And the same happens not only in cyberspace, but in the physical realm as well. The by default, a shortened uh, level of the risk and <clears throat> your ability and your resilience to address that risk actually is determined by the risk that you will face. A very uh, brief overview, what is a supply chain attack is widespread scenario for the supply chain attack for exploiting vulnerabilities. So um, usually this is the company that produces the software. Um, it's digitally signed uh, to validate the trustworthiness of the software, but this company, then it goes for service to end users. Uh, the supply chain called as a supply chain because there is a compromise or violation of trust somewhere in a chain. And usually the threat actor uh, uh, targets the, um, the part where the software is digitally signed or verified by the manufacturer. Once it's compromised, it's signed by the valid digital signature of the manufacturer and then goes to the users. So users might not be really aware that they're using compromised software. And this is the problem why, um, and this is actually explains why supply chain attacks are really difficult to detect at early stages. There are different ways for, uh, for implanting um, the um, infections into your corporate network for software, for firmware implants, and for hardware implants. The ones actually traditionally was perceived as the last possible way, as the last possible scenario, but the current um, investigations, media investigation, and the stories from the IT security community prove that hardware implants is also one of the possible scenarios for threat actors to, um, to compromise your supply chains. So um, one, of also, one of the final thoughts is that supply chain attacks are really um, poisoning the trusted mechanism and are really difficult for IT security community because there's a following paradox. We often told that we have to install updates of the software to make sure that we will not be victim of the supply chain attack. So if there's a vulnerability discovered, the software vendor or someone else told us, tells us uh, you have to uh, install the update to close that vulnerability and be safe. However, at the same time, supply chain attacks lead to the conclusion that if you also do not install updates, you might be vulnerable to security issues. So this is the paradox that the IT security community currently faces. And again, clear message is that from one simple backdoor and a single supplier, the threat actors can damage multiple larger targets. And the difficulty of the supply chain attacks is that you may be a target um, in the way that your software or your infrastructure could be final target for the threat actor to compromise, but you also may be a weapon and you actually might not even have the knowledge about this because you will not notice that something suspicious goes on on your network. Speaking of the implications for the economic development, um, there could be several effects. First of all, the security effects. Uh, so, and the clear example is that for example, not Pitya attack or WannaCry ransomware attacks when the compromise of the vulnerabilities of technologies led to economic loss um, in particular um, sector, in the particular company or entire economy or through multiple supply chains across the globe. Then there could be safety attacks. Um, and this is one of the alarming trends that IT security community sees currently. Uh, with IoT more and more embedded in the critical services that serve the needs of the society, there could be safety attacks, meaning the loss of life, uh, injury to persons, um, or damage, 
physical damage. Um, the key example which has uh, recently happened, this is the compromise of the hospital infrastructure and as a result, the death of the patient. And finally, less tangible effects, but still um, very difficult, just simply address. This is the lack of trust or confidence in a particular technology if it has been exploited once, for example, or in a particular sector, a particular company, because you as a users can no longer trust that this company actually uh, operations uh, will be secure or safe for you. Uh, what could be even the gravest effects is the lack of the confidence in the market, in the economy, or particular policy measures of the government. For example, the attacks at the elections infrastructure that happened in 2016, um, they brought a lot of concerns among the, among the societies whether to use IT, uh, ICT technologies in the ele election infrastructure makes sense. So um, people were worried that they cannot longer trust to those that possess the election infrastructure and they cannot longer trust to those that actually use uh, new digital technologies in the elections infrastructure because it's the question of the uh, democratic development. So those are three key categories that uh, I personally see, maybe there could be more, uh, would be happy to discuss them. Thank you. Thank you, Anastasia. It's uh, <clears throat> a little bit worrying when we start uh, like this with the, with the risks which are everywhere. And I think the underlying um, bit is that uh, in most cases, we don't have a control over over the systems in a way or, or um, security of, of these third products. And that doesn't stay only for, you know, us having the network or, uh, or our own uh, infrastructure organization, but also for those that are producing the services, as you mentioned, which are relying on third party products and they might be insecure. So the whole chain in a way is, is, um, could be insecure. Uh, I wonder if there are any, any questions or reactions uh, uh, from, uh, from participants on this and any uh, reflection on the African context uh, when it comes to, um, well, the risks, but also then these um, effects of, um, as, as you mentioned, security, safety, and, uh, and trust. Um, any reactions? Anyone wants to briefly comment? You can just grab the mic, uh, post um, a comment in the chat, or um, raise a hand, up to you. Feel free, and then uh, We'll just uh, even if you if you type it, we'll uh, we'll pass it in in the discussion. Uh, in the meantime, let me let me ask Danionas, um, as as someone who is actually uh, uh, there on behalf of the government in a way. Uh, uh, I guess you're you're not that much into um, concern of the techn technical aspects, but rather what are the impact, the political economic impact of this insecurity. Uh, what are what are the impacts that you see on economic development of, uh, of basically these uh, threats that uh, Anastasia mentioned? But before that, I think Beryl raised the hand. So uh, Beryl, please go ahead. Um, thank you. So my question, uh, which is also sort of like a comment, is um, I'm wondering if there's going to be another um, presentation on at the macro level, or rather micro level, uh, and that I mean by at the individual level, given that now uh, this we're, most of us are working from home and um, we do not have the secure um, uh, networks that you would normally expect um, in a work environment. Um, if you're working from home and maybe that is, uh, if you're connected to a work, there might be some kind of security there, but uh, what about those uh, who are working as individuals or small small companies, SMEs? You know uh, that might not have uh, might not necessarily have the kind of secure networks that uh, big corporates might have. So what 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 are what are the risks and uh, how can those risks be mitigated? Thank you, uh, thank you, Beryl. Uh, important question, particularly in these uh, times of uh, of um, a pandemic. Uh, I wonder, Anastasia, if you want a brief reaction before I pass the floor also to Jonas. 
Uh, yes, thank you for for the question. Is actually one of the concerns I think many governments, currently many companies, large enterprises, and cybersecurity community tries to tackle. How actually, uh, when the uh, small and medium companies are part of the global supply chains or the value chains, and also users, they also live in cyberspace, and they could be the biggest link in compromising and exploiting vulnerabilities. How to make sure that those parts of the value chains are properly secured as well as those that have obviously more resources and more capacities to do so. Um, one of the obvious reasons is the capacity building is that actually support through the direct exchanges and uh, through public-private partnerships from larger enterprises, from, from government to those small and medium companies to actually hear what the first um, gaps that have to be filled and then what actually could be done the trainings, the education, the raising awareness, uh, the learning courses, uh, those could be particularly impact. The second is, I think, is what the Geneva Dialect tried also to implement and um, made a big, big, uh, I think, effort for the entire community. This is the, a lot of standards, there's a lot of security specifications, especially when more and more countries try to define their own regulatory approaches to that problem. So it's really important for those that are smaller companies that have less resources, less experts, to have, I would say, user-friendly list of the particular practices that have to be implemented to make sure that the security is implemented in the technology, in the operations overall. So this is very big, I would say, um, success that Geneva Dialect did. However, I, was, I, I don't have the questions, but I have the answer. I think that there's certain limitations, even though we have certain capacity building efforts, we have certain um, the standards and the user-friendly specifications. Still, there are limitations from the market part. I think small and media companies um, are not always incentivized to invest in the security by design because it's a question of the return on investments. This is the questions why the CEO of a small company, I don't know, the platform that sells the books, why the company needs to invest in the greater security. Uh, one question might be because there are particular sanctions and the fines uh, might be as a, as a consequence of the regulatory compliance. But again, the question is, okay, if there's a fines and me as a CEO of the smaller company, where I could find those actual particular budget and resources to find experts to find budget for implementing security controls and so on. So this is the big question. I think this is a role probably for governments to step in and also to provide um, favorable economic context and the market incentive to make sure that the small companies also understand that security is important. Thanks, Anastasia. And, and I think this is a really relevant question, Ben, that you, that you mentioned, uh, particularly the SMEs, okay, the organizations as well. Um, because they are, well, the SMEs are the, the ones which are, in a way, underpinning the economies uh, these days, uh, I guess, across Africa as well. Uh, <clears throat> and <clears throat> in most cases, actually, what we use is a, is a equipment which is uh, produced somewhere abroad. Uh, I would, I would uh, guess, at least in, well, I come from Balkans here, we don't have much of a production of digital, we do have some digital services, uh, maybe, but it's, again, a part of the bigger process, which is, let's say based somewhere in the US or elsewhere. Uh, so you don't literally have a control over the whole, uh, the whole uh, process of creating services that we are using that might change in Africa. I think there is a lot of potential in Africa for new services, but then the question will, will be actually, how do you make sure that you, you make your own product products in a way more secure? Uh, I'm passing back to Jonas now. Uh, also maybe Jonas certainly you can reflect on the other aspects, but this aspect of Small and medium enterprises, and uh, which are underpinning the economy, is also a very interesting one. Jonas, you have to unmute yourself, or I can do that if you wish. Uh, no, I'm unmuted. Sorry. Perfect. Yeah, thanks everyone for joining, and thanks Vlada for giving me the floor. Greetings from Bern. Well, very well, really very relevant question on on the SMEs and 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 also on the individuals that are um, need to be protected also during COVID-19 and lockdowns and so on. And um, this is uh, really something that we also have discussed in the Geneva Dialogue because usually, I mean, the risk is a bit, uh, maybe a bit lower for, for individuals and small and medium-sized uh, enterprises because 
threat actors, they often, for example, ransomware attacks, uh, they often go, um, uh, they often go after the, the big fishes or, or where they think that they will have a, a larger impact, but still there, there is certainly a risk uh, to, to be victim of an attack because, uh, yeah, there are all sorts of threat actors around that, that, that use uh, malware that is, that is actually freely available on, on, on the dark net uh, that you can, that you can employ also to target individuals. And, and here, I think um, um, there's currently a debate going on um, um, also uh, in our country and, and also in the OECD, how to, um, how to make uh, software developers, and Blada mentioned that software is often developed uh, abroad and in, in, in bigger companies that is then used by SMEs and also by individuals, um, how to make it uh, more secure so that security by design is, is embedded and also security by default. Um, uh, um, these principles are being embedded in the in the software, and that software developers also, or the, the 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 vendors of the product, have a have a duty of care for the for the um, uh, for the users that are using the product. So there is this shift of perspective from the individual user towards the the producer of of software at the moment going on. Uh, uh, and and there is the willingness of, of governments um, to put a greater burden on, on on producers, so to say, so that if you click on a and often it's it's phishing attacks. I mean, often you you are clicking on a file, you think it's coming from from somebody you know, or, or you you want to hire someone and he sends you uh, some 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 corrupted file, you know, and and then you you are being uh, you are you are already being attacked, and so there. I think uh, there's currently the debate uh, going on that that uh, software needs to be more secure so that the such kinds of attacks are are, are being stopped uh, uh, a bit earlier. I mean, there's lots lots a lot has been done already in this in this respect, but um, I think there's still more to be done. And and currently we are seeing also a, for example, in the OECD, the Organization for Economic um, Cooperation Development. Uh, we, we see um, a study coming out with, which says uh, producers should have more uh, with a duty of care towards towards the users of the software. So this is, I think, one aspect. And then the other aspect that also Anastasia mentioned, uh, awareness raising and, and capacity building are certainly very important because we see it all over the world that people don't know enough about uh, how, to, um, how to verify uh, the senders of the messages, uh, how to before they click on something, and, and how to basically check whether 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 they are where, where they are acting in a, in a secure way in in the, in the internet. So there's much more to be done here, I guess. Um, so that's um, that's my comment on on this. I don't know if there are further questions on this one, and on the general on on the. Um, um, integrity of the supply chain that uh, that also Anastasia mentioned. That's actually something which has also been mentioned by the um, uh, by the UN Group of Governmental Experts in 2015. That states need to make sure that the supply chain is uh, that there's integrity in the supply chain globally. And obviously, we, we cannot we cannot do this without uh, without the private sector. So that was actually. That was actually the link for us to to get involved in in the Geneva dialogue because the private sector is developing hard and software uh, states can can do something to verify whether the, the it's secure or not they can they can do labeling schemes the licensing and so on it's all very costly steps and even if they want to do these uh, labeling uh, licensing schemes uh, for software and hardware products uh, uh, they need to work with the private sector there so that's why we uh, we're launching um, the um, the Geneva Dialogue, and that that's actually the link that I see between what what Anastasia mentioned about the supply chain attacks and and the efforts also at the global level that are that are going on uh, in in the UN. And um, now to to um, tackle Vlada's question on the impact uh, or economic impact of vulnerabilities uh, on economic development. Yeah, I think. Um, Vulnerabilities, you have to see them as a risk. Uh, and then if you see them as a risk, as I said earlier, you, if you are a very small company, maybe the risk is not so, so big than if you want to grow your business and, 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 um, 
uh, and and if you want to um, sell product support and also uh, grow it to a major major business, and then you really have to invest into into um, into security because at the at the beginning, um, um, companies might also have an incentive to to place their product at the market early on and not to invest in security, but this can then really uh, quickly uh, fail because because um, if, if they are growing their business and then if they then don't do not have the processes um, developed to to basically uh, um, attack also security aspects and make the software more secure, then uh, the, 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 the the whole business model might might actually fail. So um, what I wanted to say at the at the outset, it might it might seem that it's more more efficient to to not focus on de designing secure products and and devices, but then afterwards, if if the company is growing, um, those those uh, issues might might come back and and then result in a, in, a, in a basically failure of of the of the business model and also um for for the whole national economy it's also relevant to to look at security aspects um although um if you are a small country with a small economy you might not be in the focus of threat actors but if you are going to digitalize more and more your economy then this might shift rather quickly, so this is, this should also be at the top of at the top of uh, of, of the head also of of, of governments currently. Um, so that's also I think where Geneva Dialogue comes in because what we realized is that oftentimes what makes it so costly to to develop a secure digital products is that it's not really um, that there's not really an economic incentive for it. And that standards are not really well known uh, across across the world, and so um, there is no common approach also among the industry, and and that's what we try to tackle, as Anastasia said, to develop more um, uh, um, yeah standards that are more easily digestible and more easily applicable across the board, also for SMEs, and that's I think the work that we have to do in the future to 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 look at this, um, how can we develop common baseline requirements that could also be applied uh, across the board. So um, that's uh, what I would like to say at the outset and maybe there are questions, comments to this thing. Yeah, uh, Anastasia has a, a, a hand up. Let me see if there is anyone else who's, um, who wants to jump in. Um, just feel free to raise a hand or again, uh, pass the, the message in the chat and then we'll reflect. Uh, in the meantime, Anastasia, yeah. Um, just a brief reflection what just John has said. I really like the comment about the responsibility, but I think um, an ideal situation, if something is bad with the product, then of course those that produce that product should be responsible. This is ideal situation, but it's probably not that simple, always simple, uh, because there are more actually links in the overall supply chains that uses that technology. And while the technology itself, of course, should be targeted in terms of the making sure that it's secure by design, secure by default in certain cases. Um, but also there could be vulnerabilities and a holes in the human behavior. So the, the risk is solid that less it has been exploited by someone. And this is the problem that I, which I think is also should be part of the discussion, but it's obviously difficult to change the human behavior. Um, another thought that I had is that probably the how, who is actually responsible and how responsibilities are divided is not always transparent. Um, and again, judging Kaspersky, how we operate, we have a lot of, I would say, libraries, models in our own software. And if something happens, if the vulnerability is discovered by researcher, external researcher, or by someone by internally, by our product security team, or information security team, then the question comes, who is responsible for addressing this vulnerability if it is third party software. Um, for us, it's more or less easily doable because we have certain security controls and we do that manually. But for small and medium companies, I think it could be also a problem of resources and capacities if they use the technology and there's a problem in external technology whom they should actually to conduct to, to make sure that this technology is timely mitigated and patched. So the problem and the lack of transparency about how responsibilities are divided may be another, I would say, stopper in ensuring that digital technology is secure, timely. And the last aspect regarding Africa, I think, is that 
the issue and the additional challenge that African countries face is that they are not manufacturing technologies a lot as other countries, but they mostly buy and consuming technology. And there's, therefore, there might be additional question is how, I mean, for African governments, how to make sure that technology operates that is it expected, how to make sure that overseas technology vendors would invest also in security for African users. While we don't have the direct, I would say, uh, powers, um, leverages to make sure the technology vendors are on the table and also work with us to make sure that these certain controls are implemented. But what I actually yesterday tried to get some stats and the graphs from the our researchers and one of the messages that I heard is that Africa was not really a key target for threat actors. Most of most of the attacks goes through the geopolitical borders. Uh, I mean, APT attacks and concerning the major cyber powers, but more and more Africa is becoming the target for threat actors as well. And this is a, one of the issues I think that will also has to be addressed. Thanks, Abid. You, you opened quite a number of uh, interesting questions. I wonder if anyone uh, wanted to jump in uh, out of the participants with the comment or reflection. Feel free to just uh, switch on the mic. Yeah, Bern. Yeah, so um, uh, Jonas, who mentioned that uh, there might not be um, much incentive for, um, you know, support this, but um, especially when you think of governments in Africa where uh, there are small economies or something like that, um, just following up on also what Anastasia just said, um, I am governments like, for example, in my country, Kenya, where um, they're introducing a lot of uh, services and then also requiring um, uh, or digital IDs and digital um, things like that. Um, and it's not just in Africa, but also example, uh, there, there is a room, there's room there for incentive uh, or rather to incentivize the gap, um, uh, encourage and um, ensure uh, digital security uh, because citizens or, and uh, basically anyone to use digital um, products and digital services, then there needs to be security um, by default um, uh, and by design. And I think that's an, an incentive to governments to start um, working because private sector of the digital products that the government Thanks, Beryl. Uh, well, you raised another very important issue, uh, and I think we had it uh, when we started discussing Geneva Dialogue, where we were mainly focusing on the private sector. And there was one of the important comments that um, the local communities, the governments, also produce services, not just uh, digital services, not just the private sector. Okay, usually it is some sort of a public-private partnership. Usually it is uh, the, the, some sort of a private sector which is developing solutions for the government. But you mentioned the uh, identity uh, schemes, uh, and uh, I think we had an update recently in Nigeria for the for the ID scheme for displaced persons. So those are very sensitive um, technologies, very sensitive services, and unless we we embed somehow um, security by by design and default with it, uh, we 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 might have a problem. By the way, uh, just a clarification for those of you that might uh, not be too much in the topic. That was one of the <clears throat> outcomes of the Geneva Dialogue. Is also what is security by design and what is security by default. I, I'm not going to read it. Uh, you have sort of definitions that we try to come up uh, within the document. So you can always refer to the uh, Geneva Dialogue website and the document to see exact definition. But basically, security by design is uh, for producers, for vendors to start thinking about security and embedding it from the first very moment of not even design, but even before that, within the processes. Um, education of the staff and developers and designers and so on. And then through each of the phases of uh, uh, developing a product starting from uh, design to um, um, that we had over there in, in, a, in a report, threat modeling and uh, 
uh, supply chain and uh, finally vulnerability management. Well, um, security by default is thought of as a, uh, going hand in hand with that, where once you enable certain security settings, let's say in, in Zoom, you enable security settings that you can uh, limit the access of different users and so on, that would be part of the design uh, phase. But then setting the product so that to the highest level of security settings when you deliver it to the users, basically letting users to opt out from security settings, from high security settings, that might be considered more of a security by default. Um, I don't know whether I explained it uh, well, but just a, a snapshot of um, terminology, it is important. Um, now, uh, uh, maybe a question back to, uh, again, is anyone, uh, does anyone wants to, uh, to jump in uh, out of the participants? Or um, else I wanted to, to come back to, uh, or, or put a focus again on, on Africa. Um, and uh, what Beryl mentioned, uh, I suppose we'll see more and more of the solutions, um, not necessarily only regional, maybe even global uh, software solutions, if nothing, coming from Africa in, in, in the next years. Um, there is quite a, quite a um, vibrant uh, development scene across Africa, and uh, yet the problems might be exactly how to make these producers, these vendors, let's say coming from Africa, actually being globally competitive, and at the same time, think about security. I think Anastasia mentioned that earlier. Uh, if you try to impose too much of obligations on, on startups and small companies and that produce um, uh, software, hardware, whatever, then they might be under burden. On the other hand, um, if, you, if you don't um, force them in a way to, to have more security from the outset, more security from, from the design phase, then uh, firstly, the whole supply chain might uh, be more vulnerable. And secondly, um, maybe we can expect more and more demand by the users for more secure products so they could even lose the competitiveness. So I wonder, you know, uh, how to make this, this soft balance between regulation or, or forcing the, the, the private sector, particularly small companies, startups and so on, uh, and, and this sort of incentives and uh, maybe um, understanding and awareness of the companies and producers themselves that they should be investing more in uh, uh, in, in security. Uh, before I pass the floor to back to Anastasia and Jonas, I wonder if anyone uh, of uh, of the uh, African friends want to uh, reflect uh, what might be particular sensitivities when it comes to um, let's say the startup scheme and uh, uh, developers in uh, in Africa and, and security. Let me see if anyone. Uh, has raised the hand, or you can just switch on the mic. Yeah, I wanted to say something about that. Sure, sure, no matter. Yeah, thank you so much. First of all, you make a very great explanation about the security by design and security by default. And of course, uh, both uh, small and medium price enterprises and startups do have obligation to think about that uh, while come up with these um, digital services, not only uh, in private sector, but also government, like in my country, Uganda, there are a lot of uh, services like the government is trying to use MDAs to give like uh, government services through digital platforms. And of course, uh, giving obligation to uh, private sectors or these startups uh, for them to think about security. Uh, I, I believe not only they, should, they have the responsibility to do that, but also uh, that they need support, uh, maybe like uh, capacity building. And also, uh, we all understand that uh, the more stronger the security is maybe imposed on a product uh, maybe the usability from like on the, like the end user perspective people find it a little bit hard so there is always like a need to strike a balance bef between making the product more secure and also making it usable so people have to understand uh, the risk that is brought by if you don't think about security when they're designing a product or even while using it. Uh, but then I believe our government and private sector or civil sector organizations do have the responsibility mm -hmm. to kind of uh, maybe do more training, more awareness and capacity building about uh, designing such products or services and also for the users themselves to understand uh, what security feature is embedded in such and uh, what risk do they do they will they face in case they do not like kind of try to uh, uh, be conscious about 
uh, the sensitivity of the product that are going to use. Uh, in the recent years, like in Uganda, we have seen uh, many like uh, like a national identity card, uh, but there are a lot of issues that we can't think about it. Like in case someone loses their that's not digital identity in case someone loses a national ID, stuff like that, because you find all the information is embedded in these products. Uh, how do they, like the government, ensure like the security of such a product that they're trying to uh, bring up? Yeah, that's something that I wanted to say. Thanks, someone. Uh, well, back to also what uh, Anastasia mentioned on capacity building, but I wonder, now you mentioned uh, we should start with, um, let's say some sort of awareness raising. Uh, where could that possibly start from? And that's maybe a, a question back to you, Norman. Uh, let's let's look at maybe Uganda or across Africa. Yes. Who might possibly have the biggest awareness already uh, to help others raise awareness? Would that be the governments? Would it be rather some private sector, maybe big ones who already have more awareness? Uh, I suppose users have maybe the least of, of awareness about security. Where, where do we start from in a way? Uh, who should be pushing for that? You know, the first incentive on, on awareness and capacity building. I think uh, the best possible avenue to start that is the government to begin it, and also big players in the private sector. Because, uh, like in recent years, I've seen like uh, like digit, uh, defend defenders and other civil society big organizations trying to build capacity, like maybe take designers or maybe for like safe tech training so that they know uh, what security. Uh, uh, like what subject and follow to implement such. Uh, like uh, Uganda has recently received like some amount of funding from MasterCard. Uh, such funding could be for, for, for actually specifically for startup companies, uh, even those playing or even those in the tech ecosystem. I think such funding should could uh, part of it could be uh, driven towards uh, building capacity for security experts uh, in the design of these products. Yeah, but like the government also there is. Uh, in Uganda, there's a program about cyber security. Uh, though it's much tailored to consumers, but I believe there is a gap uh, in also like, cause you're trying to tell the consumer that this is going to be like this and that, and you're supposed to be aware of your security, but uh, designers do not do, do need to understand very well what security feature they implement or what, uh, what product requires certain security feature so that the usability is, is, is all right and it's intentional, yeah. I think, sir, one of the one of the findings we had in uh, uh, across the discussion in Geneva Lab was actually that uh, the security by design goes beyond, let's say, the programmers, the coders, right? Uh, that it it should be embedded in the from the CEO level in a way uh, and the organizational aspect. Now, maybe back to and uh, I can let me see if anyone also other wants to jump in, uh, but I uh, I wonder whether um, maybe one of the findings that we or or food for thought that we had. Uh, in our discussions was that actually the big companies might be the more aware and, and probably the partners of the Geneva Dialogue are a good example of that, uh, that already are aware and are doing a lot to secure their own products might be this catalyzer of you know, awareness raising for other companies and then ultimately the governments uh, possibly uh, and, and start this chain of awareness. Uh, and I wonder Anastasia, if, if you have any since I know that Kaspersky is doing a lot of capacity building as well. Uh, do you have any idea uh, how that could be done, let's say for, for an African uh, scheme, whether where the big companies could work with the regional companies or directly with the governments? Any experience that you can share, Anastasia, or thinking on how to start that? Um, first of all, I totally agree that probably the government would be one of the obvious choices for those who could incentivize the artists in the market to invest into the security by design and learn more about this. I think um, I, as you can't really make the software in a vacuum, you can't really regulate in a vacuum as well. So um, the government would be probably the first one. Um, I also agree that the bigger companies that operate in different jurisdictions would be also a very helpful partner. And just judging from my personal experience, the opportunity when your company operates, for example, in Singapore, in Australia, in the European Union, in Russia, in the US, and you have the ability as the employee of that company to actually to assess the maturity of different markets, to compare them and to see what are the different initiatives happens across, across the globe. One particular um, conclusion is that we see many and more countries 
try to develop what has been developed in other countries and it's a very positive sign. For example, we might see that the, the bill that has been proposed in Singapore um, uses a lot of very good practices that has been already adopted in the European Union on the cybersecurity and the certification labeling scheme and the data protection. The other thing is that we see that the more companies actually engage with across different jurisdictions and have the direct means to communicate what should be done and what should not be done with different governments, those multinational companies, I think, also the very good instruments to make sure that there's a less fragmentation across the globe. Then how to use that knowledge of those bigger companies that might operate in different jurisdictions and might learn how actually, what are the, the most effective mechanisms is through is through public private partnerships is through trusted communities is through direct dialogue so um the geneva dialogue is a key example of that building trusted communities and discussions uh among industry among government and i think this is a, one of the possible ways to explore for the african community for african companies and the government to be a part of those communities as well to learn what has been done, what are the best practices and the bad practices, um, and also try to then to see how those practices could be implemented in Africa with the African specifics, and try to also maybe initiate something the same. So the the final message is that the communities and the partnerships and the possibility to directly exchange the dialogue. I think this is the, the, the main solution I, to tackle this such a rapid development of ICT technologies and making sure that the policies are not lagging behind. Thanks. And uh, well, we, we did have uh, some discussions since we have a Papua New Guinea ICT a cluster in, as, as one of the partners of Geneva Dialogue, and they are mainly uh, gathering the, the startups uh, and, uh, and so on. So that was an interesting um, experience for us also, and that's why I encourage uh, having more of the African partners at the Geneva Dialogue, uh, that we can then look into what are their experiences on cooperating with the uh, well, big guys, but also others uh, on, uh, on uh, taking over some uh, good practices on security by design. And uh, maybe even as they enter the markets, uh, particularly the startups, uh, to um, uh, you know, consider security as being one of the advantages, commercial advantages, basically, uh, and something that can make them more competitive on a global market, because we, we do see more and more um, well calls and, and the demands for security of uh, of services and so on. So that might be one of the one of the uh, options. Um, uh, Jonas, I think uh, I'm not sure whether you raise a hand, but you can jump in now and then. I... I can, yeah, I can, I can address some some of the issues that have been said. It's really interesting discussion. Um, well. What I wanted to say one one uh, one way, and I think what is what connects with Vlada just said about the the demand for more secure digital products, and that it might also be competitive competitive advantage uh, in the future, is that uh, more and more governments are looking towards uh, labeling schemes as efficient uh, way of regulation. So what has also been um, said before that we need to make uh, that the users more aware of of how secure the products are and, and also the that governments need to incentivize this. So one, one way of, of doing this is obviously developing a labeling scheme that, that would make it easier to understand for consumers what is what is in the product. And I think we will we will see more and more of these initiatives coming up now and, and uh, therefore also a more uh, let's say diversified and, and, and structured market for for more secure digital products. So this is something something to watch and maybe also something that African governments can take, take on board in the future um, if they want to, um, to have a somewhat light, light approach uh, towards, towards uh, regulating and creating a market for secure digital products. Um, and obviously what has also been mentioned um, that there's a big push also in Africa to develop uh, um, by, by governments to, to, to become more digital, uh, to, to have digital IDs, uh, 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 other uh, uh, digital payment systems and so on. And, and, and this is really a, 
I think also a huge problem that still that, that is still um, um, to be tackled. How do we protect uh, the personal data? And this is, has been outside of the scope of the Geneva Dialogue discussion so far. We only touched uh, slightly on it. Uh, uh, um, uh, security for for personal data. How to how to uh, uh, how to ensure this is obviously a very big discussion, and we don't have solutions ourselves. Uh, uh, in our part of in, in, in Switzerland, we are therefore very cautious, and there's a big debate about uh, electronic IDs and and so on because it's really touching upon uh, upon sensitive issues. So um, that's that's really also something I think where where a debate uh, also involving civil society is, is needed and, and uh, what Switzerland is actually uh, doing at the moment because uh, uh, in Geneva we have the International Committee of the Red Cross, they are also engaged in, in uh, many contexts across the world with humanitarian data and, and there's also in the humanitarian sphere a big push to use more electronic tools to collect data about, about uh, refugees and, 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 and so on. And there's also the big problem how to secure this data so that it's not being compromised and can be can then also be um, uh, be, be leveraged by, by by different actors to put pressure on individuals and so on. And this is this is the debate that that we 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 are having at the moment uh, and that 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 really is still in its infancy and and that uh, really needs to needs to be uh, needs to evolve and 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 uh, needs to tackle these uh, thorny issues of, of personal data protection that's something that is so, so an off topic for the Geneva dialogue but since we are discussing it now um, I think it's, it's something relevant also to um, to address thank you no and I, I think uh, I mean the, the issue of data is basically uh, uh, cross-cutting uh, this this discussion about security because ultimately we are protecting the information now we are also protecting the computer systems and, and people, our lives, as uh, Anastasia said. But the data is, uh, is uh, one of the main assets that we protect. And I wonder, I don't know, Beryl, if you, <clears throat> if you want to uh, reflect uh, uh, what might be the role of uh, uh, civil society organizations in this, not necessarily just when it comes to awareness raising of the communities or, and the users, but also connecting uh, the governments and, and private sector. And uh, I don't know whether that, whether that is possible, but... Uh, because you are, as, as, as civil society communities, you are thinking mainly about the safety of the, uh, of the end users of, of their data, of their, of their, of their safety. Uh, what could be the role of the civil society, particularly maybe in, in Africa? Any, any thoughts, Beryl? Um, not much um, that I'm, uh, there's a lot that the civil society could do. Um, uh, normally on the platforms that um, uh, exist, for example, like the Kenya ICT um, Action Network is, is one of those that uh, bring government and uh, civil society together, as well as in the, and um, it's a platform, it's also a, plat a platform, advocacy so uh, where issues are concerned you know for example when you've mentioned things like um, uh, security by design and then labeling you know um, those are things that that can in, uh, um, enforce but they can do that when when civil society bring brings that to the awareness that uh, it, it's important that uh, they they enforce such standards and then also such platforms it's not just for governments it's a multi-stakeholder uh, uh, platform so you have um the the private sector coming in and having dialogues um, uh, which are normally organized every now and then and so i think there should be more avenues like those where civil society to get work together with the private sector and the government rather than everybody working and that i think that's that's one of the ways in which uh, about um, can do as part as part of, uh, of the regulatory um, framework. Thanks, Beryl. And I guess uh, back to um, the discussion we had on uh, on the public services that are also uh, present and quite important uh, across Africa, which are actually offered by the governments. Uh, that that might be one of the um, connecting dots. Uh, 
for raising awareness of the governments as well and the private sector as a corporation that it's not just something that the private sector should be dealing with but actually there is a security of, of the public uh, services in a way uh, which is closely linked to that uh, i wonder if anyone else wants to uh, to jump in um, feel free to again raise a hand or, or uh, post a comment um, and otherwise I, I wanted to do a final zoom out on what could be done more systematically on, on the African level when it comes to this. Uh, uh, and I, I noticed that Barak has also joined. I don't know, Barak, if, you, if you're if um, you available to switch on. Uh, one question is, what are the existing uh, African um, instruments or fora, if you wish, uh, that could help uh, enhance this discussion and maybe bring in more of the private sector? Certainly, I mentioned at the beginning the Malabo Convention, which is the, the basics of, of the uh, security discussions across Africa, but it, it has still not um, was not taken up that much by the governments. Uh, maybe that could be one one link. The other is this uh, expert group on uh, on the internet governance and cybersecurity in the African Union, um, and maybe that might be one of the you know mechanisms to enhance this cooperation or, or push it forward. So I wonder if anyone uh, again, Barak, if you if you are available or anyone else uh, from the African perspective, if uh, if anyone wants to comment. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, uh, Vlada. Uh, I'll turn off my video. I was uh, on the move. Um, just to answer your question, uh, other than uh, the Africa Union uh, Convention on uh, Personal Data Protection and Cybersecurity or the Malabo Convention, uh, majority African countries are uh, participants in the International Standard Organization um, security process. And uh, by this, um, most of us may by now, I'm sure in the room are aware, uh, ISO 27,000 related of standards. Uh, and uh, by default, most African countries through their national uh, internet, or rather through their national Bureau of uh, Standards, uh, contribute in one way or the other to these standardization processes. Fortunately, uh, the usage of these security standards and the awareness of these security standards is very low, which impacts negatively uh, on um, uh, deployment of security products, even uh, from uh, service providers. So I think this is one issue that as stakeholders we may want to address because Africa Union is a concern about um, uh, about adoption or uh, ratification of the Malabo Convention. But part of the reason why the Malabo Convention is not being ratified is because awareness on security security standards is extremely low, and it's an area of capacity building or an area of capacity development uh, which will impact. Uh, how the overall security uh, paradigm is viewed in the continent. So I think uh, that's one thing that I would like to raise for reflection in this meeting and uh, probably bring in input from any other colleague. Thanks, Barak. Uh, and I hope you're not driving, uh, but just uh, sitting. Uh, thanks for the input. Uh, well, the two, two interesting bits. One is uh, related to standards. Uh, we did have um, quite some discussion within the Geneva Dialogue among, among the companies on the role of the existing standards. And one of the uh, current findings is that uh, while first, there are not really that many standards that are applicable uh, in sense of security of digital products. There are some, and we listed in the document, but not that many. Secondly, they're not that easy to follow for many reasons. They're not always very practical. They're not mandatory. Uh, sometimes they are they are expensive, at least for small companies to, to jump on on that. Uh, so that is something that we definitely want to follow within the discussion on Geneva Dialogue, and that's not an African issue only. Uh, on on more usability of the standards and how do we make sure that more of the uh, companies actually use it? And I'll, I'll uh, let also Anastasia and, and Jonas reflect on that. Uh, and the other one is uh, certainly that I think capacity building resonates as. Uh, um, probably one of the, the key messages of this meeting. Uh, so this is something that, that we're 
looking at uh, throughout the next year as Geneva Dialogue continues to uh, focus even more on capacity building, but we'll be discussing that further. I know that Jonas has raised the hand. Jonas. Yeah, thank you. Basically, you addressed this already. Um, I just wanted uh, to, to, to reiterate the message that the standards are not really well uh, applied uh, globally. Uh, uh, that, that's what the takeaway that, that we got from the Geneva Dialogue, that even for larger companies, it might be difficult to, to really follow those standards. So um, because they're pretty complex and, and uh, they, they need a, a quite a large uh, uh, resources allocated to them and, and commitment. Uh, and that is not always the case because there's not enough market demand. So maybe this will change in the future, but, but what Vlada just said, a takeaway was that we need uh, more easily digestible baseline requirements. There's work on that already, for example, by the Charter of Trust, they have developed um, uh, certain baseline standards on security by design and so on, but this has only limited reach globally. So uh, we, are, we, are, we want to continue this, this work uh, next year and, and to involve also more experiences globally so that we can have a result which is um, yeah, which is shared uh, at a global level. So that, that would be the goal. And, and I think, yeah, that the, the, the standards, um, obviously everyone is contributing in some way or another, but still they, they do not reflect uh, the, the global experience at, at the moment, I, at, at least my uh, takeaway from what we, what we discussed within the Geneva Dialogue. And building on that, I think one of the important discussions that you also mentioned, Jonas, is uh, that, that uh, there is more than just standards. There is certainly the best practices of the company, something like what we try to collect within Geneva Dialogue. Uh, so there is best practices, uh, there is standards, which are not necessarily in line always. Um, there is uh, regulatory frameworks, which are, as Anastasia mentioned at the beginning, uh, sort of fragmented, and, uh, and that's also an issue. And there are global uh, principles that are emerging uh, both within uh, multi-stakeholder fora and industry fora and governance, govern, government fora, basically, uh, as high-level principles. So how do we um, synchronize all of those and come up to some sort of baseline requirements, very simple ones on maybe multiple levels of uh, what should be done at basics by startups, then by bigger companies and so on, and how they could evolve with the security by design, that might be something to uh, consider. And that's something we'll definitely focus more next year. Um, Anastasia, any, any reflections from your side? Um, first of all, totally agree what has been just said um, about the necessity for the baseline requirements and the practices. Um, and I agree that there are no, all standards are easily applicable. So the context is very important, the context of the company, particular company, the sector, because the standards are obviously also sector specific. Um, but I'm recalling what actually at the last IGF session on the Geneva Dialect, the David Cole representative of the Singapore has said that it's important to have those standards, but also important to uh, consider the cultural uh, specifics in applying and developing those standards. So, in the case of the African countries, I think this is what also should be taken into account that it's great to see more and more African governments, uh, for example, within the UN uh, discussions, within the UN OWG, the representative of Kenya is a part of the DG and OWG, and that's really great to have also the African perspective. Um, Egypt is one of the also active uh, participants of the global discussions within OWG and it's great that more and more countries from the African continent are being engaged because I, I believe this will ensure that there's a discussion and the exchange of the just existing best practices but they should be also applied with the account of the specifics and the cultural background of the African continent and a particular context in which those African technology vendors users operate and live in. So I think it's very important to understand that it's not that universally and automatically applicable. Um, yeah, this is this is my thought. Thanks, Anastasia. I don't know, Jonas, if that's the old hand or the new hand. Ah, uh, it's the old hand, but I can uh, say okay. something. I mean, yeah, sure, sure, sure. No, following upon what uh, Anastasia just said, um, and there's a reason, uh, Barak mentioned that standards are not mandatory, and there's a reason for this, uh, because, yeah, as Anastasia said, it's, it's really context-specific, and there would be a high cost of uh, 
mandatory application of, of those standards across the board in all companies, economies, not in a risk-based way, you know. So, so that's why governments, I guess, are hesitating also to make them mandatory. And I recall a discussion I had guest yesterday with the colleagues from Singapore who have launched this labeling scheme for, for, uh, for IoT products. And uh, they said they, in the beginning, they were also considering making, making the licensing uh, requirement for, for IoT. Uh, but then they discovered that um, basically the market would not, uh, uh, that there would be a, a, a too few devices on the Singaporean market because <laughs> basically the, 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 the certification would not, uh, would be too costly for, for manufacturers. So then they, they decided on this voluntary approach. So this, this is a good example, I think, that uh, uh, we need uh, simpler uh, requirements and uh, and uh, basically a risk-based and also nuanced approach, uh, as Anastasia has just pointed out. Um, yeah, and uh, otherwise, particularly in, the, in the regions such as Africa, where you can expect more and more, at least digital services and, and maybe software, uh, this could impact again the economic development, the, um, the development of new solutions and innovations and so on. So <clears throat> some sort of a, a balanced approach is, is definitely needed. And I guess, again, back to, back to the cooperation. Um, before we uh, run to the couple of messages from the event, any other um, reflections from the participants? Anyone who wants to sort of um, add, uh, add um, a final thought uh, in this discussion? Or, well, if it's really scratching the surface still, uh, we'll have much more time to discuss that in, in the years to come, that's certain. Any reflections? Anyone wants to take the floor? Okay, um, and uh, again, apologies, Luke and, uh, and uh, other colleagues that we don't have uh, um, translation here at the, this workshop. I think it's, it's only for the plenary sessions, not for um, the workshops. Um, but uh, this multilingualism is definitely something that's uh, also important in, in these discussions. Uh, I'll pass the floor then to Andreana to just uh, summarize a couple of uh, key messages maybe taken from, the, uh, from this discussion. And then I guess uh, at the end, I can just give a opportunity to Anastasia and Jonas to give a, a final tweet of their own messages. Andrea. Thank you for the floor, Vlad. Um, I prepared three short messages. First, we need more easily digested baseline requirements and standards. Mandatory application would be too costly, and that is why the context and cultural specifics of the company or the sector or the country are also important in standards application. Uh, next, the impact of security of digital products on safety and rights of the citizens, such as with regards to national ID schemes, must be taken into account as well. And I will finish these messages with a message on capacity building, capacity building for companies and raising awareness for governments, especially those that provide services is important and should be taken into account. That will be all Vladan, from me. Thank you, Andreana. I think this maps uh, the key, the key uh, messages. Um, I don't know, Jonas, let me start with you. Um, your final tweet, if you wish. Yeah, I think um, my takeaway, since I don't want to repeat the messages made by Andriana, my, my takeaway is basically uh, that uh, also we need, we need more active uh, uh, civil society uh, uh, to, to, to push for to push for awareness uh, in, uh, of the government uh, towards introducing digital technologies uh, uh, in the population. Uh, and uh, yeah, in this connection also more capacity building um, so that, that civil society will be empowered uh, to, to, to call for these changes. That would be my, my takeaway from the discussion. Thanks, and uh, I would probably add that uh, with civil society, we also should uh think of the technical community, academic community, all these others, so in a, in a broad sense, not just the organizations. Thanks, Jonas. Uh, Anastasia. Um, standards are really great, but it's not that developing standards just for standards. I think this is for making our human life secure and better in cyberspace and the physical uh, space. So I would say that the more discussions and the more dialogue and more if possible, physical connection between different communities, different stakeholders should be taking place and build and invest in more communities, uh, trusted communities and the partnerships is very important. So we have, and we need to learn from each other and it's really great to see 
uh, also African countries, um, the Asian countries, and all other from other continents to be at the one table and to discuss this. Thank you, Anastasia. Um, I guess this is a good uh, concluding point. And uh, what uh, is rest for me is just to thank you for joining and I invite you again to uh, well visit the website of Geneva Dialogue, uh, provide your comments on the uh, current uh, document, if you wish. Certainly help us uh, reach out to um, the African companies that could uh, uh, become uh, partners in this dialogue. Uh, and let's stay in touch uh, and uh, continue this discussion. Many thanks for joining. and. Uh, Thank you so much. Thank you so much for organizing and making this a success. It's been a very great deliberation. And I thank also everyone for working it. Thank you, Norman. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye.